You know, every family has family lore, the stories that get told and retold over and over again. You know the story and how it ends, but every time it's told, you still enjoy it because it tells you something about the people you know and love, and there's something that's so true about those stories. One of my family stories involves fear and the absence of fear. When I was 11 months old, my parents moved our entire family to Brazil so they could fulfill the call to be missionaries. So all four of us, my mom, my dad, my brother Travis, who's two years older than me, and I, we all got on the plane to go to a new country. And we were young, so it was a great adventure for us and for my parents. And when we got there, we ended up renting an apartment on something like the 10th floor. It might have been the 11th. It was high up and there was a balcony with a railing on it to keep these young kids from walking off the balcony to our deaths. One day, dad is inside playing with us kids and my brother decides he wants to check out the balcony. So my dad lets him go, but keeps an eye on him. He wants to see what he does if he backs away from the edge or if he's drawn towards it. Well, my brother, he's fearless. And I think he's always been fearless. He gets out to the balcony, sees the railings, and decides he wants to learn how to climb. So he starts climbing the railing. My dad, being a curious guy himself, moves closer, but keeps watching. He wants to know if my three or four year old brother is ever gonna chicken out, or if he's just gonna keep on going. So my brother climbs and my dad watches. And my brother climbs and my dad watches. Right up until Travis gets right to the edge of the railing, my dad jumps in and scoops him up. My brother is fearless. And honestly, I'm kind of impressed every time I hear this story about the fearlessness of this three or four year old. And I wonder if he climbed without fear because he knew dad was there and would rescue him. But don't worry about that. Can you imagine being the parent in that situation? Not just in the moment, pulling your kid off the railing so he doesn't take a header from the 10th floor, but realizing that you have a fearless kid on your hands. Fear is an interesting thing, isn't it? Your heart starts to beat faster, your, your focus sharpens, narrows in on the problem. Adrenaline starts pumping. Your body produces cortisol, a, a chemical that helps repair damage, and it increases energy. You're still you, just more and less at the same time because your thinking can get a little foggy because your brain's chemicals are rearranging resources to help you fight or flee. And that can sometimes make you freeze too. You can even get dopamine, an addictive feel-good chemical that's part of how we're wired. Some people love being scared during movies at haunted, on haunted houses or as adrenaline junkies, and some really hate it because of that. So here is discussion question number one. Do you like being scared or do you hate it? If you do, like if you do like it, what type of being scared do you enjoy? The surge of adrenaline, the, Hall uh, the Halloween houses that scare you, when your friends jump out at you, that sort of thing. And if you don't, why not? The first time we see fear in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3. Eve is having a conversation about the one limit that God put on Adam and Eve in the garden, that they weren't supposed to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 to 5, the serpent, which generally represents Satan, makes a statement to Eve. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, this is interesting. This happened before there was knowledge of sin. In the good garden that God described as very good, the possibility for fear still exists. The implication is that fear in itself is not all bad. In fact, fear could even possibly be considered a good thing. All of our adre adrenaline junkie friends, they're all getting really excited right now and a whole bunch of other people are getting somewhat annoyed at me. Sorry, parents. But at the same time, the first time that fear is introduced in the Bible, it's also being used to undermine, undermine humanity's relationship with God. The, the fear presented here is, you can't really trust God, He doesn't really want good for you, and He isn't really good. And the tricky part is that when it comes down to it, fear can be a good thing and fear can be a bad thing. Both of these things are true. So when we go forward in the Bible, we see a lot of fear. And why wouldn't we? 
The Bible tells the story of God and humanity, and we humans can be a pretty fearful bunch. And we see fear happening in the Bible in positive lights and in negative lights. We see fear being felt in destructive ways and fear being felt in positive ways. In fact, one of the best examples of this can be found in the story of when God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. It says there was lightning, thunder, sounds, and smoke on the mountain where God was speaking from. And Moses says to the Israelites, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. In your workbook, you might want to circle those two references to fear. Do not be afraid and the fear of God will be with you. Before we dive into this a little bit further, we've come to discussion question number two. How can fear be a good thing? You know, once you've talked that over now, why don't you go straight on into discussion question number three. How can fear be a bad thing? Take a minute, just right now, write down your answer. Do you have something that is keeping you up at night? In Exodus 20, verse 20, the key distinction between the two fears listed is those two little words, the fear of God. You might want to underline those two words in the workbook. We know that fear can be good, like when it's humbling. A fear of my parents would protect me in the future when I wanted to do something and my parents said no. I may have wanted to do something wrong or harmful to myself or others, but understanding that I am not more powerful than my parents would eventually keep me from doing something harmful as a child. And fear is a good thing when you realize that you are not invincible and you come face to face with something more powerful than you that wants your good. We've seen that fear can also be negative. When it overtakes your senses and when it hyper focuses you and paralyzes movement or pushes you into a fighting stance when no fight is necessary. Destructive fear happens when we stand in front of things more powerful than us that want to destroy us. It's focused on our inabilities, what is within our power to fix and what we cannot fix, what we can try to control and what we can't control. Fear that brings health and wholeness is one that is rooted in the understanding of the power and sovereignty of God. It comes from understanding that what produces fear in us does not produce fear in God and that God is good. When we understand that God is not afraid because God has nothing to fear, and that God has nothing to fear because there is nothing greater than God. When we understand that truth, then we can find freedom in choosing to listen to God's voice over our fears. That's a pretty good description of the word trust as well. You know, when we were little in Brazil, we took a boat ride to an island called Ilha de Frages with some other missionary families who wanted to make a day trip of it. This was a long time ago, and safety standards, I'm not sure that they applied the same way. And it was Brazil, so I'm definitely not sure that safety standards applied. And in my version of the story, most passengers didn't have life jackets, except for my brother and I. And I think the boat was overloaded, but what do I know, I was, I was pretty young. I remember there being rust, and this makes sense, it was in the Atlantic Ocean, there was salt water, and it had sails and a motor. It also had wood railings, that sort of thing. So that tells you it was an old boat. And our family loads up on this relatively large boat with too many other people, and we travel across a bay to get to this island. But when we get there, there's no dock. The only way to go visit the island is to jump from the deck of the boat into the water below. And this boat is high from the water. Again, Travis and I were pretty young. I might have been four years old. And the boat was big. In my head, it was a couple of stories. Talking with my parents, eh, it might have been a 15 foot drop into water, which is a lot when you're young. Now my parents had us in a life jacket. 
uh, each, and they knew what the life jacket did, but I was too young to know that it would save me. So my dad went first, and he was waiting down in the water while my mom was up on the deck with us and telling us to jump. Honestly, I have a memory of it being fun. I don't even remember visiting the island, only of jumping into the water. And I don't think I thought it was fun before I jumped, but it has seared in my brain as a fun experience because I trusted my parents and my parents were trustworthy. It's an interesting thing. Two stories from Brazil that involve jumping from a height. One would have been negative, the other was positive. Parents were involved in each situation. It's not the fear that is the important part of either story. It's trusting the parent. If my parents weren't afraid, then I don't need to be afraid because I can trust the goodness of my parents. And that's the challenge for every single one of us. The one that comes right from the beginning of the Bible, that very first fear. Can we trust God's character and nature to be good? The good news for every Christian is that we have centuries, even millennia, of seeing the goodness of God. We have the stories of all those who've gone before us and the stories of those who are alive and part of the church today. And we even have our own stories of God's goodness. In the last book of the Bible, called Revelation, there's a scene that describes each of us who currently follow Jesus. You can find it in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 to 11. It talks about how we do have an enemy of our souls, and it, and it talks from some time in the future describing us and the Christians who lived before us, describing us now and the Christians who lived before us. It says that a loud voice starts talking about us, and it says they triumphed over him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The testimony is simply the story of what God has done in our lives, what we can call God's stories. It's the story of God's goodness. And the more we tell the God stories of God's goodness in our lives, the more we remind ourselves about how trustworthy God is. And a trustworthy and good, all-powerful God who has nothing to fear is the greatest source of comfort and courage. Take a minute amongst yourselves for this question, question number four. How have you seen the goodness of God in your life? God is sovereign. He is over every ruler and authority, and He is good. He is great in power and good by nature. That fear that you wrote down earlier, the thing that literally or figuratively keeps you up at night, it tells you that there is something that is out of your control, and it has real physical consequences on your heart, mind, body, and your relationships. That fear definitely does. But God is not afraid, and God is powerful, and God is good. God is more awesome and awe-inspiring than any person you've ever met. And nothing will ever diminish God, His authority, His ability, or His goodness. You can trust His character. You can trust His voice. And when He says, take courage, you can. Some of you may find yourselves in a season of security. I was happy on the boat. My parents were trying to get me out of the boat for my own good. It was my parents who were inviting me past my fear. Maybe that's something that's going on in your own walk with God. We've just come through the sh weekend as a church when we're turning down the noise to hear the voice of God. And maybe God is inviting you to take a step out, a step past your fear. The stories you have experienced, the stories you have lived, and the stories of the people around you right now, they're a key part to overcoming that fear, the fear of stepping out in faith. God is good, and if He is calling you to something, then He is calling you for the purpose of good. One of God's most often repeated commands in the Bible is to fear not. The positive way to say the same thing is take courage. In the coming four weeks at church on Sundays, we'll be looking at four different areas in our lives that Jesus says take courage. It will include looking at how God is in control, at the future promise that we have, at healing and at forgiveness. Through this small group, our prayer is that you will take courage no matter what situation you may be facing, that you will see God's power and mastery over all things, and that you will grow in your relationship with God. Discussion question number five, is there a specific week you are looking forward to most throughout this series or anything that you hope gets covered?